Graffiti was initially seen as a crime and the artists, mostly teenagers, as criminals. As the years have gone on, just like many other parts of hip-hop culture, it's become a more universally admired form of art. So as we look at hip-hop at 50, ABC's Megan Wright shows us the evolution of graffiti. 1980s New York. Hip-hop was the soundtrack of the city blaring through the neighborhoods on boomboxes, blasting groups like Run DMC. As the music solidified itself as a part of New York culture, so did another expression of hip-hop, graffiti. I think graffiti was that, that shot heard around the world. It sort of just feels like you own this piece of the city once you've sort of put your name on it. It was kind of like a raging, adolescent, teenage form of expression that was citywide. People then viewed it as yet another crime plaguing their city. Artists using paint cans instead of brushes, turning subway cars into their canvases. It turned into a battle of sorts, the seemingly fearless teenage graffiti artists against the city, which waged a campaign against them, led by then New York City Mayor Ed Koch. Just simple vandalism, uh, said to the MTA, uh, it's out of control. Picture New York subways, and most people see grime and graffiti. I think graffiti is ugly. It makes the trains look dirty. I don't think it's on. What do you think about, looking back, some of the things that you guys were were doing? Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was insane. Nobody loved it. Graffiti artists, known as writers, snuck into the rail yards late at night to stake their claim, hoping millions of daily commuters would see their tags moving across the city. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. I was able to see the, the subway trains from here since I was seven, got infatuated with the, with the colors, the bright colors on, on the subway trains. Connections. Bronx graffiti writer Wayne One took us for a tour around some of the spots where he'd spray his art as a teen, recalling what it felt like when he first began. The train pulls in, right? I, I, see, my, I, see, I see my piece roll in, right? There's a, there's a bunch of guys standing there with their school bag, and they're looking at it, right? Your art critics are right there. It's not like the art world. In real-time feedback. Oh yeah, real-time feedback. And it became like an addiction. Thank you. Okay, what do we have in here? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I call my mess hall. Lee Quinones is a renowned artist whose work sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Great paint. And he honed his craft by painting subway cars. This was a visual movement that was coming from a place of it was coming from a place of art, but it had so much influence that brought so many people that never thought that they could ever be an artist. I felt I was going into those places that were very dangerous in their own, in their own way um, to come out more together on the other end. As the presence of graffiti art spread across New York City and beyond, so did its cultural imprint, leading to what's viewed as the first movie about hip hop culture. 1983's Wild Style. The movie featured real-life graffiti artists like Fab Five Freddy and Quinones. It's such a, a window into a very innocent, sincere time. It's amazing that that film has that kind of elastic energy still to this day. Today, the film is so ingrained in hip-hop culture that it was recently screened at the Tribeca Film Festival. It all started a little something like this. The film was about a much larger look of culture, of teenage culture that had been evolving since the beginning. What was hard was getting funding because <laughs> at this point, it's amazing, as pervasive as hip-hop culture is globally, it wasn't at the time. I had never made a feature film before, so like everything else, we did things illegally and we did things um, by the seat of our pants. You both have mentioned hip hop. For people who don't understand the correlation between graffiti and hip hop, how would well, you break that down? We should point out that at the time when we were making a the movie, there was no, there was no, this is what it's called. It was just these things going on. We helped kind of push the fact that it was hip hop and un because of Wild Style put all of these elements together as one. 
then that became the perception. The same year Wild Style was released, so was the documentary Style Wars. It followed several graffiti crews made up of mostly teen boys, showing the dangers they face for their art and the pushback from those who didn't understand. Among them, a boy known as Dez TFA. They're trying to make it look like graffiti riders break windows and everything, and they ain't even like that. When Dez wasn't painting, he'd spend days in the park on turntables, a dedication to the craft that led him to become one of New York City's most popular DJs, DJ K Slay. Before his death last year, he reunited with Style Wars producer and photographer Henry Chalfont, reminiscing about the early days of hip hop culture on K Slay's Shade 45 Street Sweeper radio show. Because one day we wanted to put on t shirts and break dance, or the next day we wanted to pull out the equipment and DJ in the park, and the next day we might have wanted to go to the train yard and paint. Nobody knew years later it would become a, a multi billion dollar industry. Like it is. Once viewed as criminals, many graffiti artists now make considerable money for their work, gaining the attention of major brands. Few are as in demand as Claw Money, but she hasn't forgotten how it all started. They were really like coming down on the transit, on the, tr on the train riders. There was this weird period where nobody knew what to do. She started painting walls, making a name for herself, creating an unmistakable signature. I think the cool thing about the claw is that it can mean anything to anybody. You can see what you want to see or assign um, attributes to it that you see. It's open to interpretation. Claw Money started her own clothing line 20 years ago and has collaborated with dozens of major brands from Nike to My Little Pony. I was happy to, to drag graffiti you know, into some of this like Americana stuff. Some of that stuff, more than the check, is some of the stuff I'm most proud of is, you know, Topps baseball cards that I've done. I did a garbage cow kid, real American pop culture stuff that like, if I can help like bring graffiti into that, that's really exciting for me. She's also focused on supporting more women in graffiti, running an all female crew, PMS. I'm a businesswoman, I'm a mother, I'm a solution-based person. That's what I'm here for. For, you know, for the street, for the boardroom, for whatever. The kid who once marveled at the subway cars is now also finding success commercially, working with brands like Nike and Reebok. Any form of advertisement today or illustrations, uh, graphic design, um, even, even, uh, you know, music videos, every form of media has been inspired by graffiti. Did you ever think that graffiti would take you to this point where your art would continue to evolve and eventually you would be at this place where you're at now? I always knew that it was art from the minute I started. I just knew that it was my calling at that time. I didn't know where it was gonna go. You just need to be true to your craft and true to yourself. As cliche as that may sound, you're the only one that has to answer to that. And your legacy is a reflection of how you felt going through that process. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.